You're listening to a message presented at Newmarket Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in Newmarket, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at Newmarket Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. And the title of the message as a result of that is True Love. True Love. True Love. Well, we do want to look at Scripture and the idea of love. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 13, and uh, John chapter 15, verses 12 to 14 throughout the course of this morning. So if you want to hold those in readiness, you can have them there. They will be on the screen, though. Uh, this Wednesday is Valentine's Day. Now, I don't know what you're doing, but my wife is working, so I'm going to go with Wally and the crew up to Cheddar's. That's, that's what I'm doing. Have you ever wondered, though, we celebrate this, this thing called Valentine's Day each year. Have you ever wondered how Valentine's Day got its start? Did you ever kind of wonder that? I mean, we celebrate this thing, but where in the world did it come from? Well, here's, here's what I'm told. What, what did you say? Cupid? Cupid did it? Cupid did it? Well, I guess that's a possibility. That wasn't what I found when I looked back at the history of it, but Cupid's a pretty good idea. And I'm sure, you know, if, if Cupid was the one shooting the arrows and making the hearts warm, that probably had something to do with it. But, but they tell me historically that way back in around 250 A.D., there was a guy by the name of Valentine that was a priest. He was made a priest in Rome. So this is a pretty big highfalutin priesthood in the city of Rome itself. He made his home in Rome. That kind of rhymes. <laughs> Valentine made his home in Rome. <laughs> Valentine, Valentine made his home in Rome. And during this time, the emperor that was reigning in Rome, his name was Claudius. So here's we've got Valentine that's a, a new priest in Rome. Claudius is the ruler there. Some people called him Claudius the Cruel. Because he did some things that to everyone in his kingdom seemed to be pretty cruel. You see, Claudius, Claudius literally tried to force his men throughout the kingdom to fight in his army. Valentine didn't like him much. Other people didn't like him much. They felt like he was just a horrible leader because they did something that literally broke the hearts of thousands. You see, Claudius wanted a really big army because he wanted to be strong and he wanted to be powerful. But it seemed like something was getting in the way of that. He thought men should willingly volunteer to go fight with him, to go conquer the world, to be a part of his army. But men were refusing to volunteer. Because for some reason, they'd rather be at home with their wife and kids than out fighting battles. So no one was volunteering for Claudius' army. And he had, he had to think about that for a while and come up with a solution on how to make it all better. He wanted to find some way to get men to step up and volunteer to go fight. The fact that they wouldn't join, it just really ticked him off to no end. He thought about that, and he thought about the fact that they were saying they'd rather stay at home with their wives and with their children. And he came to a conclusion. The conclusion he came to is if they were not allowed to get married, they wouldn't have wives, they wouldn't have children, and they'd be more inclined to join my army. So what Claudius did is he decreed that there would be no more marriages throughout his entire kingdom. They were done. No more. Well, the young people that were living there in Claudius' kingdom thought that this new rule, this new law, was really, really, what were you going to use? Strange? Anything else? Ridiculous? Anything? Huh? Hogwash? Huh? Cruel. Any others? I'm a hillbilly. I just saw it just plain dumb. But, uh, you know... Uh, 
But the people there, they thought it was really, really dumb, really, really cruel, hogwash, anything you want to put on it. And Valentine, the priest, he thought it was absolutely ridiculous too. One of his favorite duties as a priest was to marry people. Mine was 30 years ago. It has gotten more and more confusing over the years. 30 years ago, you married a couple, they stayed married for a lifetime, and things just kept going. Now you get ready to do a wedding, and you've got the last wife and the wife before that, and all their families, and they're trying to figure out where to set them all. It gets real confusing. It's not nearly as much fun as it used to be, but back then it was a lot of fun. They enjoyed doing the weddings, and he was not happy that Emperor Claudius had made it so he couldn't marry folks anymore. So you know what Valentine did? He decided, in spite of what the emperor thought, he was going to keep right on performing marriage ceremonies. But in order to keep his head, he had to make sure he did it in secret. Because if Claudius found out, it wouldn't go well for Valentine. He would get inside a, a room with the two people that wanted to get married, and he would whisper the ceremony, Dearly beloved, You can just imagine the quietness, the whispering, and all the time their ears were perked to the hilt, listening in case there might be footsteps outside the door coming to find them and lead them away to prison. One night as he was whispering the vows, one night as he was whispering the vows, they heard footsteps coming up the walkway toward the door. He ended the ceremony really quick and he ushered out the couple that he was marrying. I now pronounce you man and wife. Get going! But he didn't make it out in time. He stayed back to face the soldiers as that couple got away. And Valentine... Valentine was taken and he was thrown into the dungeon and told that his punishment would be death. That's pretty bad punishment for just marrying a couple of folks. But in marrying them, he had defied the order of the king. And the king had to show that he was the one who was in control. While he was locked up in that dungeon, many of the young people who knew what Valentine had been doing, their hearts were touched. And they came to that dungeon to visit Valentine. And whenever they got there, they would throw in notes and they would throw in flowers through the bars of the prison in order to let Valentine know how much they appreciated his willingness to risk his own life so that they might be wed one to the other. They wanted Valentine to know that they too believed in true love. That they too believed in marriage. One of the young people that came to visit Valentine on a regular basis was the daughter of the jailer. The man who kept him in the dungeon. The man who kept him locked up. The man who made sure that he didn't get away knowing that if he did get away it would be his own life that would pay the price. The prison guard. His daughter came to visit Valentine and her father being the guard, she got plenty of time with him. She would go in and she would visit Valentine and she was allowed to spend hours and hours of time with him just talking there inside of the cell. She believed with all of her heart that Valentine had done the right thing when he ignored the emperor and decided to perform marriage ceremonies in order that the young people could be wed to one another, have families, and enjoy life. On the day that Valentine was scheduled to die, he pinned a note to that guard's daughter, the one who had visited him so faithfully. For her friendship and loyalty, he pinned a note and he signed it. He signed it like this. Love from your Valentine. Love from your Valentine. That one little note started the custom of exchanging love notes on Valentine's Day. It was written on the day Valentine died, February 14th, 269 A.D. Valentine's Day has been around for a while. Now every year on this day, February 14th, 
people remember Valentine's commitment to love as they make a commitment of love one to the other. You know, when I was in grade school, we gave out Valentine's, so I'm, I'm one of those people that can remember back there. I'm thinking some of you might have done the same thing. Remember those decorated boxes? We sit there, we put hearts on them, we decorate those boxes, cut the slit in the top, and you would wait for your friends to bring a Valentine's and put them inside of the boxes. Now this was really good for some kids. I mean, if they were popular, they got all kinds of Valentine's cards. They put suckers inside the card and things to let them know that they were particularly special or Tootsie Roll or, or Bazooka Bubblegum. You know, they get in trouble with this class afterwards for having it in there. Um, they got all kinds of things inside their box. The popular kids did really well, but the kids that weren't quite so popular, it was real tempting not to put the suckers in their cards. It was real tempting not to even give them a card at all. And sadly, some of those who were not well liked would would have received no cards at all if it were not for the watchful care of their teachers, making sure that everyone had cards inside of their boxes. The fact is, people, and kids especially, they treat love like a commodity. If you are somebody... I mean, if people look up to you, if, if you are the, the jock at school, or if you are the cheerleader at school, if you're somebody special, if people look up to you, you're treated one way. If you look a certain way, I mean, you dress in, in all these fancy clothes. What are some of those fancy clothes names? Izod, I remember Izod. Pro, Prada, is that a clothes name? What, what? Those are shoes. Those are shoes? Anybody, what are fancy clothes? I, don't, I get mine at Walmart, I don't know. Sometimes J.C. Penney's if I really want to splurge. And whenever I don't want to, I go to Goodwill. <laughs> what are those fancy clothes names? You don't know either. Polo. Okay, Polo. Any others? Huh? Gap? That's, that's what we used to have. We kept the horses in with. Wire with a stick? Huh? Hollister? Yeah. American Eagle? So, so there are, you know what I'm talking about, those, the fancier clothes, if you look a certain way, you wear fancy clothes, then, then people, they really, they want to show you love. I mean, that designer clothing, it can do it for you. It says, if you have that designer clothing, I'm going to love you. But if you don't, you don't expect anything from me. Friends, that is not true love. God describes love for us in the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, verses 1 to 13. And it is a beautiful description. It's going to be on the screen. Let's read it together there. It says, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clinging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that I can move mountains, but have not love, nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put off childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Is your love patient, friends? Is your love patient? I guess you could say, true love puts the needs of others first. And my wife will tell you I don't do very well at that sometimes. I try. 
Sometimes I say the wrong things when I think I'm saying the right things. It's hard, this being in love stuff. We've been working at this for 37 years of marriage, almost 38. And we dated for four years before that. We've been working this almost our whole lives, and we still don't get it down all the time. It is challenging. But I guess you could say true love does its best to put the other person first. I'd like to share a brief video that exhibits this kind of true love. I had Addison preview it. And she looked at me when it finished. And she said, Preacher, that's just plain depressing. You'll have to decide for yourself. I thought that this boy's love for his girlfriend was amazing. But Addison didn't quite catch it. See if you can. Here goes. Mm. Take care of yourself and my eyes. That is true love. It's amazing, isn't it? Do you put the one that you love first? Or do you choose the path that best suits your needs? Like the girlfriend. I got my eyes. I'm done with you. How about you? Is your love kind? Has your love set aside envy? Has your love set aside boasting? Has your love set aside pride? Does your love refuse to be rude? I wish mine did all the time, but sometimes that one gets me. Has your love moved beyond self-seeking attitude that many so-called lovers exhibit today? Have you got your anger under control? I don't do so good at that one sometimes either. Told you I'm not perfect. It's a challenge. I'd say ask my wife, but she might tell you, so don't. Do you keep running records of the wrongs done to you? Do you willingly forgive? Do you trust the one that you love? Do you protect the one that you love? Does your relationship overflow with hope? Are you committed to making sure that your love perseveres no matter what? Do you possess a love that never fails? Or do you possess a love that would sacrifice everything to make the one you love complete? That's the kind of love Jesus has for us. Willing to sacrifice everything to make us complete. God has set the bar really, really high. In John 15, verses 12 to 14, we read these words. It says, My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. As we love God, and as we love one another, let us always remember, it's not going to be easy but it will always be worth it. Are you ready to say, God, I really, really love you? Are you ready to declare that God's love is perfect? His love for you is, is, is what makes you complete and extends His grace and makes your salvation possible? Are you ready to look at God and say, God, I recognize only you could do this for me? Are you ready to admit that God is worthy of all your love, and of all your praise. If you're ready to make that commitment, I want to encourage you to come as we stand and sing this morning our hymn of commitment, Only You. You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.